Ms. Lima, I do have your test here, so let's go over the questions that you missed. <coughs> First question, it says, Sam is determining the area of a triangle. In this triangle, the value for the height is a terminating decimal, and the value for, a ba for the base is a repeating decimal. What can be concluded about the area of this triangle? So when you are calculating with numbers that are rational or irrational, if all of your numbers are rational, any type of calculation you do with those numbers will continue to give you rational numbers. Terminating decimals and repeating decimals are both um, rational numbers. So we got terminating and repeating. So both of those types of numbers are rational. So the area will be rational because the numbers in the formula are rational. Also, so that's the one half uh, area of a triangle is one half base times height. So one half <coughs> is a rational number. The base is a repeating decimal that's rational, and the height is a terminating decimal. So that's also rational. So everything um, comes out rational. In question two, it says, what is the range of the function on the graph? Um, so it's not all real numbers because you can see that the graph uh, starts at negative three and is every y value. So the range are the y values. So we're looking at how high and low does the graph go. So it's not all real numbers because the graph does start at negative three and then goes up from there. So it's all real numbers that are greater than or equal to negative three. Question nine, what are all of the x-intercepts of the continuous function of the table? So when we have an x-intercept, it's an ordered pair that is some value comma zero. So the y value of the ordered pairs is zero. So in this example, we look in the table, where are the y values zero? And that happens when x is negative four and when x is positive four. Um, the choice you selected would have been the y-intercept because when we have a y-intercept, then the x value is zero. Question 14 asks, which is a valid prediction about the continuous function? So when we're looking at intervals, you kind of have to look at each one of these uh, individually. We're looking at intervals. So the first one says from negative infinity to positive infinity. So what that means is if you extended the table in both directions, if we kept going values less than negative three if we kept going in that direction to the left or if we kept doing values that were greater than um, two in that direction, what, what would we expect the graph to keep doing? And we wrote that uh, the first one says that f of x is less than or equal to zero. Well, that's not true because we've got a value here where f of x is actually uh, greater than zero. So the first answer choice is not correct. The second answer choice, we're saying that f of x is greater than zero from negative one to infinity. So that's that direction. That says the x's get bigger. Um, and you selected that f of x is greater than zero. But you can see here, um, we've got a y value that's negative five. So that's less than zero. That one doesn't work. The one that is correct is just talking about the interval from negative one to one. So from here to here, and it says that f of x is greater than or equal to zero, and that is true. We go from zero to five to zero. Um, so that would be a valid prediction. Question 18, which is a possible turning point for the continuous function f of x? So when we're talking about turning points, we're looking at um, where things get, where things change signs. So you can see we're getting uh, from eight to two, that's getting smaller, right? We're going down, we're decreasing here, we're decreasing here, but then we start to go back negative one is greater
greater than negative 2, so this would be your turning point. Um, then from negative 1 to 0 and from 0 to 4, those numbers keep getting bigger. So we're decreasing all the way to here, and then it starts increasing. And so there is your turning point for the function. And I think there's one more question down here. Yep, question 25. Which of the following is always irrational? Um, so again, we talk about computation. We've got to ha we have to have some sort of irrational number in the computation in order for it to be irrational. So two fractions, that's not correct because fractions are rational, so their sum will be rational. The product of a fraction and a repeating decimal that's going to stay rational because fractions are rational and so are repeating decimals. The sums were adding of a terminating decimal and the square root of a perfect square. Perfect squares are all rational. If the square root of 81 is the square root of 16 because this equals 9, this equals 4, those are whole numbers that I can write um, as fractions by putting a 1 under them. So perfect squares are all rational. It's this last choice because we're talking about the square root of a non-perfect square. If I take, try to take the square root of a number like 10, it's somewhere between 3 and 4, but non-perfect squares, there's, there's no whole number that you can multiply by itself to get 10, right? 3 times 3 is 9, and 4 times 4 is 16 and 10 falls in between there. So 10 is a non-perfect square. That is an irrational number. So when we're looking for always irrational, we have to have an irrational component in that computation. So I know you were pretty proud of yourself. You did do a good job. So if you wanna uh, make another attempt at this, you're welcome to do that. Um, and if you have any other questions, please reach out.